So dear friends, I'm once again here with you and I'm sure last Sunday was a good experience for you with your grandparents, senior citizens, perhaps some old uncle and auntie, your grandparents and so many others connected with your family. We prayed for them. I got reports of many churches that I had celebrated along with the senior citizens and you could see from their smiles from their happy dispositions that they were grateful for having remembered them. Uh, surely there are other feasts also that we celebrated this week, the Feast of St. James, the Feast of St. Anne, and the next week also we are blessed with many feasts. As I said last time also, the Feast of St. Ignatius, I have spoken about it, the Feast of John Mary Vianney, I have spoken, but then I will say something more about our priest today. And of course, Transfiguration is also coming on the 6th of August. Before that, let me pause a little at the message of the readings of this Sunday. They are beautiful. I would say perhaps they are, they define our life itself. What is life? Perhaps who is God to you? Do you believe in eternity? Because many of us live as if nothing will happen. Nothing can disturb us. We are so much secure today, so we think that there is no need of worrying about the future. But the Gospel and the readings today give us a very another aspect of life. And this aspect is something very special, I would say. Because the Gospel says, what you see is not the only thing. What you eat, what you gain, what you profit is not the only thing that gives you happiness. We have to think also of life beyond. The Gospel taken from the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 verse 13 to 21 gives us that beautiful parable of the fool, or we may call him a wise fool. The quotation that starts with is, Beware of all covetousness, because one's life does not depend in the abundance of one's possessions. Many of us think that perhaps money is the thing that will save us. Our insurance, our securities, and Life is something else. I would say life is short for those that don't expect it. And in that sense, the money that you have amassed, the wealth that you have, the possessions that you have, perhaps what use is it? You know, the first reading has also a beautiful message from the book of Ecclesiasticus. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The author so beautifully says, there is nothing that is permanent. Everything is passing. And everything is passing that which we think perhaps is permanent, will give us permanent happiness. And that itself is vanity. Because you have toiled hard to build something in your life, but then you have to leave it to someone to be enjoyed, one who has not toiled for it. You know many of the stories of our families. The parents, the father, struggle so hard. He's every moment of his, perhaps every day of his, sometimes they don't even take a rest. They work, 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 you know, to gain more and more money, more and more belongings for their family. But then when they are no longer there, when they die, surely they leave it to their second generation, but of what use or how much use they make of it. You know, in the book of Isaiah, we have a beautiful saying, why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Many of us are spending our money, our wealth on things that perhaps are transitory. They are not eternal. They are not lasting. But we think perhaps our life depends on them. 
and you know that rich fool that I was speaking of he the parable says that he went on amassing and amassing because he had a good bumper crop that year and he said my go rounds are not enough and I will build some more go rounds you know to store the grains so that I can be forever happy and the parable says that night he hears the voice of god to say that fool what is it for you or rather for whom will shall you leave because your term your time is counted and that's for most of us to say that our life is not dependent on these things the doctors can give you medicine but they can't promise you health the banks can give you money and money but money doesn't give you anything more you can eat and eat food stuffs but you can't consider it to be nourishing as such you can take as much insurance as possible but then it will not profit you perhaps it profit someone else after you so in this sense life is not permanent it's vanity of vanities everything is vanity and therefore this gospel asks us some hard questions what are we what are we living for why are we perhaps so much in those things that do not give us life why search among the dead one who is living that was the quotation that we heard when the three maidies and the others went in search of jesus after his death and the angel tells them why search among the dead one who is alive let us search the one who is alive among us that is jesus because he is eternal he is permanent St Paul tells us in our letter to the other Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 If you have been raised with Christ seek the things that are above and these things that are above will give you joy happiness and surely contentment for all your life that doesn't mean that we will live an easy life the crosses will be there the difficulties will be there the poverty will be there the struggles will be there but in spite of all this to have the consolation that god is with you perhaps the greatest consolation that you can be satisfied with my friends i now take you to what we call the viani day pastors day we call it you know last time i spoke about st john mary viani and i won't repeat once again but just a word about our pastors We have this beautiful sentence from the book of Jeremiah which says I shall give you pastors according to my heart who shall feed who shall feed you with knowledge and understanding that's the work of the pastor God has given us pastors God has given us priests as it were perhaps I can understand they are not the best they are not in whom we can sometimes see as models role models i normally say that we priests are human though we have a divine calling the humanness is still with us and perhaps even the weakness is also with us but i ask myself every time why did god choose us knowing for sure perhaps that we will also let him down maybe even betray him but god wants our pastors to take care of our people and whatever they are you know in this synodal consultation that we had in different parishes all over the archdiocese and perhaps everywhere we could hear many many criticisms about our priests that some of them don't care some of them perhaps are proud they are haughty they are not even bothered they don't even celebrate the sacrament there were so many things I don't disagree with you but at the same time perhaps our pastors also are doing a work a service that perhaps no one else wants to do I see many a times the people who criticize the priests the people who perhaps who would say that our priests are good for nothing I can understand but then why didn't you choose 
the ministry of priest to yourself why did you leave it for such weak fellows i can understand there are many many who are better than us they could have done a better job i think so but then why didn't they take up the challenge they left it to certain priests who are there so what i am trying to say is pray for your pastors today the feast of saint saint john mary vianney remembers reminds us very specially that the priests are in need of your prayers and surely a little appreciation on your part to say father thank you thank you to your pastors give them a smile perhaps give them a hug to say that in spite of what they are they are still holding the fort holding the church and asking us to follow them in order to take the church of the modern times ahead please pray for your pastors very specially on 4th of august that's the day of the saint i have suggested that 7th august that's a sunday the parishioners could wish the priests and make them happy recognize their talents recognize their responsibilities their problems and perhaps this would melt the ice a little in places that are that you think the priests are hard thank your priests thank your pastors and pray for them i now pass on to the feast of transfiguration that we will be celebrating in next week that's the 6th of august and 6th of august is a very special day in the sense that this feast of transfiguration reminds us or rather affirms the mission of jesus as a savior you know historically or perhaps evangelically we can say in the gospels that jesus takes his disciples three of his close disciples to mount tabor and he transfigures or rather he changes his his countenance before them they cannot understand but they are full of admiration and jesus gives them a glimpse of the what we call the heavenly life or his own resurrection and our own resurrection of so small a slide as it were and the priests the disciples are enamored and they ask themselves they ask jesus why not make three tents and let us stay here itself why do we have to go down but jesus reminds them this is just a a so sort of a preview of what is going to happen but we have to go down we have to go down to the people and once again i have to carry the cross when jesus said speaks about the cross the disciples are disturbed very much because they would like always to be in a sense of glory but jesus gives them the message the reaffirming his own mission that he transfigures for the sake of their understanding but he remains the same that he will carry the cross once again go for his suffering death and rise again so my dear brothers and sisters the feast of what we call the transfiguration is a meaningful feast for us and i hope you will participate in the eucharist in your parishes and ask the lord to give us also that satisfaction of being transfigured or resurrected one day in spite of our problems and difficulties and after obtaining the forgiveness of our sins i now pass on to what we call the synod we had a very important and momentous event in the archdiocese on the 27th and 28th of this month you know what's a synod the holy father proclaimed a synod for the whole church and this synod was not to take place not only in um, vatican or rome itself but in every parish in every parish all over the world in every community in every group in every committee as it were these synodal discussions or consultations took place and the three aspects of the of the synod were brought before us participation mission and also a sense of gathering among us acknowledging our community aspect with us and so the synodal questions that were given to many of our parishes you know 
I think is the statistical data of our diocese. So that many synodal meetings we had, and as I said, many of the answers or responses that come were very revealing. Surely there were a lot of criticism about the church, about the priest, about the pastors, about our institutions, but also people were also happy to participate in this. So what happened on 27th and 28th at Bangalore? We had the national synodal meeting to synthesize or to bring about a synthesis of all the diocesan synodal observations here in Bangalore. So these two days, our three cardinals of the of India, Cardinal Gracious from Bombay, the Cardinal designate Philip Neri Ferraum from Goa and Cardinal Desecrated Antony Pula from Hyderabad along with 15 other bishops and 45 other delegates were here. And the delegates from all over India, north, south, east and west, from the Kashmir to the Kanyakumari and from Gujarat to the northeast as it were, all of them were here and gave beautifully their regional, their diocesan perspectives and all these were discussed and we, we had consultation here and with this consultation comes the phase of the diocesan consultation what we call the Indian synthesis has been prepared. This will be sent to Rome and in Rome will be discussed on the what we call the world level before that the continental level also the world level and the Holy Father next October along with the Cardinals bishops and also many Delegates and lay people, men and especially women will be taken into consideration to synthesize once again on the world level what we call the universal synodal consultation. And surely the Holy Father will come out with a statement of which will be very much useful for us and relevant for us. And I must say that we had this consultation here in the Palana Bhavan with all these delegates, it was a very happy experience for them that they were here in the Palana Bhavan and I could make out from their comments that all of them were happy, they were grateful for our hospitality and surely some of them also went around the city of Bangalore appreciating the climate and the good things about Bangalore. We are here in Bangalore, we don't realize perhaps the many good things but the outsiders tell about us and tell the things that perhaps we have been doing and blessing and surely God is blessing us in many ways. I now pass on to what we call the questions that you have put before me and it's a very nice question and the question is about yoga. You know what's yoga? But the question doesn't speak of yoga. Perhaps I could show you some yoga poses if that was the, this one, but the question is very tricky. Does the Catholic Church prohibit or approve yoga? I said this is a very tricky question. First of all, what is yoga? Yoga is a set of exercises that help to you to tone up the body and especially the breathing exercises and they are focused on certain points or perhaps certain physical attributes and the other inspirational figures. And yoga, since it comes from a Hindu tradition, is very much connected to the Hindu religion, religious aspect and focus on the Hindu mythology, Hindu gods, Hindu realities. And surely, perhaps to say that the part of yoga is also part of our Hinduism. So perhaps the question is asked whether the church prohibits yoga in itself. I would put it this way. Perhaps we can see it from three aspects. The first of all, yoga that is connected to the religious aspect of Hindu, which means a certain focus on a god, goddess, and there are also certain forces that come out of it and maybe we can even speak of the evil forces that are at work in the body, in the nature of which perhaps the yoga is called to be an answer. 
And so we say this aspect of yoga that is connected particularly to Hindu religious aspects perhaps is not required of us. And I don't say it's forbidden as such, but then our Hindu brothers and sisters are very happy with it. We will also perhaps appreciate their stressing on yoga for these matters. The second way of looking at yoga is yoga is also a set of exercises that tone the body and especially the breathing exercises that make you alive and fresh. And I think there are many people who perhaps may not associate yoga with religion as such, but would be happy to do the, all the exercises and be part of this sort of to keep yourself fit and especially your breathing, which is very important for the body. I would call, consider is yoga without the religious aspect. The thirdly, there are some among us who say that can we not also speak of a Christian type of yoga or Christianize yoga as such. Because if yoga speaks of certain religious sentiments of the Hindu religion, can we substitute them and put them, put our God or our principles in those places where we can meditate in a central manner on the Holy Trinity or perhaps certain aspect of Christianity and in that way perhaps we can take up some yoga exercises and many of our people who have taken up these say that yoga is a good, gives us good uh, sort of capacity to meditate, to concentrate and therefore we can use Christian objects or Christian principles in order to perhaps Christianize yoga itself. We can't say that everything that comes from all the other religions is bad. We can take certain good elements from them. You know, the Vatican II in the document, Gaudium et Spes means Gaudium means the direction as such, the guidance, and Spes is the hope. So this document says that in every religion there are seeds of faith there. And therefore perhaps we could also take this. I give certain examples, for example, the rosary, you know, the rosary with the beads. I don't say that's only our religion. We see so many Buddhist monks and our rishis also holding what we call the beaded sort of garland and they use it. They use it. So therefore, we can't say the rosary is invented by us and perhaps some say perhaps it may have come even before we could start using the rosary. There are also some other elements that perhaps we can, for example, there are certain words and certain themes that have been taken also from the others when we celebrate what we call the Deepavali, the festival of light. You see, light is very important for, even for our religion. The right light is the symbol of Christ, resurrected Christ and his light. Sunday, Sunday, you know, if you break the word Sunday, it's a day of the sun. They say that even before our Sabbath could come, the, from the pagan history, from many, many years, I would say millions, thousands of years, this day was celebrated by the pagans as a day of the sun. Because for them, sun was the God. And now we also celebrate Sunday. We don't consider sun as the God, but we have taken the attribute or perhaps the meaning of Sunday the day of the Lord. For us, our Lord is much more than the sun and the sunlight. So therefore, the Sabbath, the day of the Sabbath, the day of the Lord, perhaps it has its roots a little in the pagan history or pagan philosophy. That does not mean that we become pagans by taking up certain things of theirs. So that's the meaning of yoga. I would say that yoga taken in a good sense as your physical and your mental rejuvenating yourself Perhaps with a little Christian concept or Christian model or Christian ideal is nothing wrong. But to take and practice yoga as something that perhaps invigorates you or connects you with the mythological gods, with the Hindu realities or perhaps certain forces, good and evil that are there in you, this would be succumbing ourselves to perhaps not the good forces but the, even the evil forces. So I am all for propagating yoga, yoga in a correct sense, especially with the Christian meaning. I thank you and I wish you a good 
Sunday, good weekend with your family. My dear friends, please do share your feedback, your impressions and your experience or send a message to the email address as you find on the screen archdblr at gmail.com and you also have the phone number, the mobile number wherein you can send your message or uh, WhatsApp on this number. Archbishop is ready and waiting to answer your questions. If you have any question, any doubt, any uncertainty or there's no clarity upon something, you can ask those questions and with the discretion that the Archbishop will surely answer these questions in the weekly feature Shepherd's Voice. Thank you and we look forward to the next episodes.